And uh, as Mike said, I've been uh, very much coming from a background in oil and gas, and then more recently uh, I've got engaged with the uh, broader energy picture. So I've been asked to speak about crossover from oil and gas. And uh, in order to explain that, I wanted to start with an example of what is probably going to become more and more a common crossover career in the energy business. The example is specifically my career so far. Um, I started from Italy, uh, dreaming of becoming the head of the national park in the mountains in Italy where I'm from. And for that reason, I went to study environmental engineering, which incidentally happened to be a continuity of the old mining engineering degree. And then as specialization, we could choose georesources. So that was really a very hybrid start. The national park, path didn't quite work out because they told me, well, if you want to join us, you have to learn how to pilot helicopters. You must have perfect eyesight. You must be possibly a, sk a ski instructor. I said, I think I'll go to university. It's probably easier. So I did that. And after the undergraduates in, in Italy, I went to Imperial for my master in petroleum. That's where really the explicit petroleum uh, development started for me. Uh, and lately, um, sorry, after that, part-time while working for the oil and gas industry offshore on the platforms, I also studied for my PhD, which was in chemical engineering, but still related to the oil and gas industry because it was on multi-phase flows. And then it all very much took off from there. I was hired by the best company in the world, which unfortunately doesn't exist anymore, Enterprise Oil, small independent British company. We were taken over by the one next, Shell. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this is another thing that does happen. And there was a particular period of time when it was uh, quite common, small independent companies being taken over by the larger corporates uh, with the challenges that that poses. Um, I then uh, moved on to Total, uh, which was based in London. And the reason for that for me was that London, uh, the London office was next door to Imperial, where at the time I was still studying for my PhD part time. So it just made things much easier. Along the way, you can see that even within the oil and gas career, I switched from being uh, offshore, uh, taking care of operations, to doing reservoir engineering, production engineering, optimization. And, uh, and then after that, I had in the meantime also secured my PhD, and I had to make the choice, either I do something with this PhD, or I just end up putting it in the pocket and doing nothing with it ever again. So that something was uh, academia. And as you talk oil and gas, uh, you think, Obviously, the largest organizations, the largest universities, uh, the other side of the ocean in, in the States. And so I decided to join Texas A&M. And um, I had to start from scratch because although they valued the years I had uh, in, in the industry in terms of publications, in terms of conventional academic uh, knowledge, I knew very little about that. So back to scratch from assistant professor, uh, working all my way into promotion and tenure, uh, which created a paradox. Tenure in America means you've got a job for life. They can never get rid of you. In the meantime, I still didn't have the green card. So um, because I made a mistake of marrying an Englishman and not an American one, he was hopeless in that, in that side. He couldn't help me visa-wise. Um, and so we decided to uh, return to Europe to be legally allowed to both work and continue. So for six years, he was commuting intercontinentally to continue working legally in Europe and he was a spouse in the States. So these things do happen. Um, and then uh, the, the attraction, however, for me, was to not only to come back to Europe, but come back to Europe with a new challenge. I moved back into a petroleum engineering institute in Germany, but I also took up the chair in geothermal energy. So that was the first time I would say that I really got serious about the overlap and crossover between the two sectors. And since then, I've never really stopped working on it and convincing myself more and more that we need to continue along the lines of really leveraging the expertise of oil and gas and uh, transferring that to the challenges that geothermal poses today. Then I went to Cranfield University because there was an opportunity for us to come back to the UK. I led the uh, uh, geoenergy center where we were doing anything in the field of geoenergy. So all the things that have been mentioned today and some of uh, the ones that we still have to hear about with the next talks, they were all included in the center. And then ultimately, uh, there was this uh, great chance to take up the ranking chair uh, at Glasgow, which gave me the breath of working on energy engineering. 
So at the moment, there is nobody else into the energy topics I can work on. And I love the intellectual freedom. I love the opportunity of linking up the different bits and pieces of the energy puzzle with the sustainable challenge of today. So as I said, I showed this as an example of crossover careers. And I believe you're going to see more and more of this because some of the companies themselves are uh, and will be transitioning to embrace broader energy topics. And we need to start thinking also more internationally. Um, again, coming back to my personal example, this is my roadmap so far. Internationality has always been uh, a, a driver and, and uh, a common theme in oil and gas in mining, but it certainly is going to be one of the main features of energy careers for the future. And I think the internationality bringing an American association here to us uh, and giving us the chance to exchange uh, challenges and knowledge is of paramount importance and we need to continue the conversation. By the way, my mom is still hoping that the cycle will close and I'll go back to it at some point. Um, okay, I decided to just uh, stay a little bit general because geothermal actually has so many different facets, just the same way that in oil and gas we've got heavy oil, wet gas, <laughs> onshore, offshore, um, consolidated formations, unconsolidated formations, we have exactly the same spread of occurrences in geothermal. On top of that, we also have applications such as the very shallow geothermal down to maximum 100 meters, heat pump in your own house, uh, serpentine in your garden. So really it, it's a broad spectrum. So I decided to only focus on what is perhaps more obvious to those who are not so familiar with geothermal and come from an oil and gas background. And that obvious is what we call in the jargon, the deep geothermal. So we're talking about um, systems that can go easily down to 4,000, 5,000 meters. And in some counties like in Germany and Switzerland, we've been looking at even greater depths. But anyway, to cut the story short, the workflow of the business is just the same as what we're accustomed to in oil and gas. You're gonna to have to characterize the subsurface before you even dare drilling a well. And if the well is dry, with the same cost as an oil and gas well, your loss potentially is even greater because the revenues from geothermal uh, energy are lower than the revenues from a barrel of oil or a cubic feet or cubic foot of gas. So you have to carefully plan your expenditure. You characterize the subsurface and then you uh, get your uh, regiment of reservoir engineers trying to calculate not only where the flow is going to go and move into during production, but most importantly, where the heat is going to go and is the heat sustainable over time. Otherwise, you short circuit your uh, underground resource and you have good temperature surface for one year, two years, and then that temperature depletes and goes down. Equally, if you're a production engineer or a driller, if you're involved in production operations, there are many similarities. We use the same service companies. There are also ad hoc service companies for some services such as high temperature logging, but very much the sequence, the workflow, the timeframes involved are the same. And then ultimately, we also look at overall field performance. We do our own resource and reserves assessment. I'll come back to that in a second at the end. And so the workflow is very similar. Uh, we've been looking at why, despite the similarities, and despite the fact that from 2014 there was a dormant period for oil and gas, why have we not been surfing the wave as geothermal sector? Why did we not take advantage of the throff in oil and gas and drill more geothermal wells? So I tried with a colleague of mine from, from the States to look at whether there was any correlation between oil price, rigs availability, and geothermal exploration, and unfortunately, the analysis confirmed that the geothermal sector was somehow sleepy. Of course, there were other reasons why uh, we didn't see an increased investment, and that's to do with the risks involved, once again, and the lack of incentives in, in, in uh, geothermal. We never saw the same incentives that the nuclear sector saw, that the wind sector has seen up to now. This is yet to happen. Uh, now, just a few slides on uh, uh, examples of crossover activities. Uh, first example is extracting the heat from the water co-produced by oil and gas wells. You've probably heard of that already. You don't even have to draw a straight line and say, from now on, I stop being a petroleum engineer slash a petroleum geoscientist and I become a geothermal person. No, there are activities that allow you to still work on oil and gas assets, but looking at the additional geothermal component. 
And if you do that, as we did, for example, for ENI in Italy and for Parenco here in the UK, you're looking at delaying the uh, elephant in the room, the commissioning and the commissioning costs. And you can also perhaps manage some incentives because it, although you are the dirty oil and gas company, you are using a green top-up component. We don't have clear business models for that to really work, but it's becoming more and more looked at. There have definitely been pilots in the world. And an example on the other side of the world is Canada. Uh, this is just a project that we have ongoing on exactly this topic. Uh, another example is, again, on deep geothermal, to look at unconventional completions, unconventional wellbore designs. In geothermal, you can use one single well in a closed-loop system, like a U-tube, where you inject down the annulus between the casing and the tubing, and then you recover the heated fluids up the tubing. Obviously, you need the right conditions of pressure, temperature, and flow rates, but that is a possibility, and you can also enhance that process by using special cements. Another example of crossover this time is with mining, is the possibility of extracting geothermal energy from abandoned, flooded mines. There is an example just uh, uh, not very far from here in Glasgow, where I'm based, of the UK Geos site, which is managed by BGS and funded by NERC. There is ongoing shallow drilling into the coal seams, and the uh, study, the, the research will investigate the water's properties, and then we will engineer potential solutions for making uh, this mining network uh, usable for geothermal energy extraction. And then one last example before I start wrapping up, uh, and I think I've definitely gone over one already, uh, is um, uh, the, uh, the crossover between CCUS and geothermal. Uh, the supercritical CO2 has uh, enhanced thermal properties. It could be a better circulating fluid compared to just water to extract the heat from deep geothermal systems. This is I insisted uh, on the U uh, because, yes, there will be some CO2 permanently left underground when you close the wells and you say goodbye to your development, but the process per se is a continuous process where you keep on moving the CO2. Uh, so now, apart from the technicalities of these uh, potential crossovers, there is also a broader um, need for comparing apples with apples when it comes to project value. If I'm an investor and I want to choose between an oil and gas investment, a mining investment, a solar investment, wind, hydro, geothermal, how do I know which project gives me more money, how quickly, and what are the risks involved? So in oil and gas, we're very used to the uh, um, uh, classification of um, hydrocarbon resources. We've got the SPE PRMS, whether you like it or not. I don't very much. Uh, but equally, there are now international tools available that offer such comparison possibility. And we've been working on the uh, UNFC tool, and specifically for geothermal, there's been a partnership between the UNECE and IGA, which is represented by Marit, whereby we developed this tool so now anyone in the world can assess and classify and report geothermal resources in a way which is totally consistent with SPE, PRMS, and Crisco if you're in mining. Okay, so uh, this is just uh, an example of why projects between conventional and unconventional are similar, but I think I've been running out of time, and I thank you for your patience and attention. <laughs>